I've always wanted to do a video just explaining the whole Bible basically from Genesis to Revelation because I know that before when I was a Christian and I hadn't read the whole Bible from beginning to end a lot of things that I would read I didn't really understand in the New Testament um, one of the things I didn't understand was how Israel became the chosen people like I knew that they were chosen because they were from the line of Abraham but I didn't understand that really deeply so um, hopefully I kind of cover that in this. This is going to be off the cuff, just me speaking. So hopefully I won't forget any big details, but so I just wanted to start in the book of Genesis and work our way through it. And just keep in mind that the perfect world was in Eden and everything that's happened between the fall of man and the restoration of man at the end will take us back to a garden of Eden like state. So just kind of keep that in your mind as we're going through this. So first we have the creation. There's the perfect world and Adam and Eve are given the seed bearing plants to eat. And then of course, Adam and Eve fall and Satan was in the garden and Satan was a cherubim. I know a lot of people wonder what he was doing there. I actually believe that there were a lot of, a lot of uh, cherubim that were in the garden of Eden. I think that it's very possible that God had put some angels on this earth to live among men kind of to help them out with whatever and that's why it was no surprise to them that satan was in the garden i don't know that for sure that's just kind of my opinion so then we come to the time of noah and we read that there was uh in chapter six there was a fall of the angels and it says that the sons of god which generally in the old testament is considered to be angels so it says the sons of god came down and made it with humans and so I take that literally, that's literally what happened. Fallen angels came down and had children with the women on earth and the whole world gets corrupted. That's from the things that they were teaching the humans here on earth. The Bible doesn't really go into detail about it. Some people believe the book of Enoch, some people don't. If you did, then it would explain in there some of the things that they taught the humans like war and making weapons and things like that. So anyway, the whole world becomes corrupted. So then God floods the earth course then he starts over with um, Noah and his family and then we come to the next story which is the Tower of Babel and those were descendants obviously of of Noah probably from the descendants of Cain more than likely and so they build this temple or this tower that they believe is going to reach the heavens they really believe that they can reach the heavens because in that time it was generally understood by the words of scripture that there was a top to the earth. It was called the firmament and they believed that they could build up to it. And if nothing else, that if there was another flood, they could escape up there. Um, now, again, the Bible doesn't tell us that, but other sources do. So then the world is divided into languages and there's supposedly 70 languages and 70 nations. Now, uh, some people also believe this is the time that the earth was divided because we had Pangea at first. All the nations were connected. Some people believe that that happened at the flood. Others, because of the wording in chapter 11 of uh, Genesis, they believe that the earth was actually divided um, at that time. Then we go on to another understanding. And Michael Heiser, Bible scholar, has done books on this topic. But is that when the 70 nations were divided that God put an angel over every nation to kind of oversee it. And that's where we get that language in Daniel where the angel comes to Daniel and tells him that he has been in a battle with the Prince of Persia. So this angel has been battling with the Prince of Persia. Obviously that was not a human. There was a prince. Uh, princes are often, they're often called princes, the ones that were put over the nations, the angels that were. So there was a prince over Persia. There was uh, Michael and Gabriel oversaw Israel. Um, and I'm trying to think if there was another one in the Bible. I thought there was, but those angels kind of help keep those nations in line. So then the people in the city at the Tower of Babel, they said that they would make a name for themselves and build this great tower. But God obviously put a stop to that. Then right after that, we read that God chose Abraham. And actually what's interesting is God says that he will make Abraham's name great um, and that the land of Canaan is going to belong to Abraham's offspring. So the people at the Tower of Babel wanted to make a great name for themselves and God put a stop to that. But then he chooses Abraham and says, I will make your name great. So I guess the point of that is God will decide whose name is going to be great on earth. But he runs across Melchizedek, who was the priest on earth at that time. Uh, Melchizedek's name, as we learn from the New Testament, means King of Righteousness or King of Salem. 
Uh, Salem, the word means peace. Now, there are a lot of people that believe that he was actually the king of the area that later became Jerusalem, and that's why it was called Salem. I don't know about that for sure, but it's definitely something I consider because uh, he was the high priest of the nation at that time, but he ruled out of Jerusalem, and it turns out later when God sets up the whole Levitical system, he makes Jerusalem the main city. To me, the Melchizedek being over Jerusalem was kind of a type and shadow of what was coming in the law, uh, that it would come from Jerusalem. But then also later, obviously, Jesus ends up becoming the king of Jerusalem and Melchizedek, but we'll get to that as we go along. Melchizedek brings bread and wine and has it with Abraham and he blesses Abraham and that's going to be a foreshadow of Jesus who has the bread and wine and blesses his apostles and you know people through himself and we also read in Hebrews later that Jesus is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now I believe Melchizedek was a real person. He was a real king of a real city. I know some people think it was Jesus. Some people think it's an angel but I believe it was a real person. God chose a person to be the priestly person on earth at that time, and he chose Melchizedek at that time. Uh, Melchizedek was not from the bloodline of the Levites, of course. He was before that. A lot of people believe it was actually Shem, Noah's son, but he's chosen by God uh, to be the king of righteousness, the king of Salem. Then we come down to Abraham's sons, and he has two sons. He has Ishmael and Isaac, and these are going to be two different nations. And God says that both of these nations are going to multiply and be blessed. But the promises are going to come through Isaac's line, the promise being the promise of Jesus coming. But it also says that Abraham is going to be a father of many nations. I know a lot of times the Jews try to say, oh, they're the children of Abraham, and we Gentiles are the children of Noah. No, that's not true, because Abraham is going to be the father of many nations. And how is he going to be a father to them? Well, even if you aren't born into the nation of Israel or you're still a child you're still a child of Ab of Abraham because of your faith. See, he's going to be a father of many nations and all those are going to be the nations that have faith in Jesus. Uh, the word there for nations is actually goyim, meaning the Gentiles. So he's going to be a father of many Gentiles also. Uh, I just want to clear that up because I know a lot of times people, especially today, there's really a push to make Gentiles think that they come from Noah and Jews come from Abraham. That's not true. As long as we have the faith of Abraham, he is the father of us all. He actually has a son named Isaac, and then Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob's name is changed to Israel, and these are Jacob's 12 sons that become the 12 tribes of Israel. Many people on earth came from the sons of Abraham because, if you know later also, um, which we'll get to, there was a split in between the uh, Israel as a whole. At first, when they came out of, out of Egypt, they were all one giant group of people. But over time, they are, after Solomon reigns, the kingdom is split, and then you have the Jews, and the Benjamites went with the Jews, and there were also, uh, the, the Levites were generally with the Jews, and then you had all the other tribes, they call them the Lost Ten Tribes, because later they were scattered, but they break into two kingdoms, so you have the Northern Kingdom, which is called the House of Israel, and you have the Southern Kingdom, which is called the House of Judah. Judah is Jews and some Benjamites, and then the house of Israel is all the other tribes. Okay. Then um, Jacob's family uh, ends up going down to Egypt because of Joseph. If you know, Joseph was sold in slavery by his brothers, so he ends up being taken into Egypt, and that's how Israel ends up in Egypt. Now, God had already foretold to Abraham this was going to happen, that his people were going to end up in Egypt. They were going to be there 400 years. They were going to be slaves, and he was going to deliver them at the end of that time. He didn't say they would be slaves for 400 years. He was saying, for 400 years, your people will be in Egypt. So they were. For many years, they lived there in the land of Egypt without any problems. But when that Pharaoh died that made the promise to them that they could live there, when when he died, that's when the, the next Pharaoh started saying, ooh, these people are strong. They might overpower us. We need to put them you know, under our thumb. And then eventually that became slavery. And so anyway, they weren't in slavery the whole 400 years. They were only in slavery for, some people think, a little over 200 years. Um, I don't know. What, the Bible doesn't say exactly that I know of, that we can get an exact timeline. So anyway, they're in slavery. They call on God and God delivers them from Egypt. And in Exodus 15, it says that God requires of them, all he asks of them when he brings them out, is they listen to his voice and they obey his word, whatever he says to do. And this is what Abraham did. So he's basically calling them to live like Abraham. 
But then we see in Exodus 16 through 19, we're going to see a series of these people doing things that are going to prove that they, they aren't going to be able to just do this simple thing, listen to the voice and obey what God says. They do all kinds of things that they're not supposed to. And if you go through 16 through 19 of Exodus, you can see that they just don't trust in him to take care of their needs. They say they had it better back in Egypt. They're longing to have meat, um, in their pots, which that's a whole nother issue, but they brought all their animals with them uh, and they weren't killing any of their animals. And I could do a whole, I will eventually do a whole show on that, but they don't trust in God and all that. And so anyway, at the end of this time, which is about two, two months later, uh, starting at the beginning of chapter Exodus, uh, Exodus, uh, what is it? 19, uh, it says that two months to the day from when they were delivered into the wilderness that God tells Moses to come to him. And he says, you know, I'm going to give these people a covenant. So go back and tell them. So he goes back and tells them the people say, yeah, we'll do, we'll do a covenant with God. That sounds great. He goes back and tells God, yes, they want to. And so God tells Moses, and this is really important that he is going to come to them on the third day. And he tells us exactly what that time frame is. He says, get the people ready, concentrate the people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, he's going to come to Mount Sinai to give them the covenant. Now, if you go down a couple more verses in chapter 19, you realize that God came also in the morning of that third day. So they received the first covenant that they got from the time that they were told that they were getting a covenant. It was the third day until it actually came. And then three days later in the morning at Mount Sinai, now the covenant goes into effect. God also had told Moses to tell the people that in the future, one like him was coming. Uh, he said that that person would arise from their fellow brothers and sisters in Israel and that they needed to listen to him. Now this was speaking of Jesus. Moses tells the people one like himself is coming, which we know that that's uh, true because Jesus was a lot like Moses. So everything from this point forward is about getting ready for that person, the Messiah that's coming, that he said will come like me. From that point forward, everything we see in the Bible from the time that, that Moses says, you know, one like me will come, uh, really from the time the law was given, everything you see in the Old Testament from the prophets to the, you know, everything that happened after they got the law, all of it is getting their hearts prepared and ready for Jesus. Because obviously back in Exodus 15, when he offered them the simple way to walk, to just listen and obey, that was just out of concept for them. And so they weren't ready for a Messiah to come. And so all this time over this next 1500 years, God is getting their hearts ready for the coming of the Messiah. And he's going to use the law to do it. Oh, I wanted to say also too, Jesus was a, was a lawgiver like Moses and he wouldn't give the same law as Moses because that law didn't exist before the time of, of Moses either. That law wasn't existent in the time of Abraham. Jesus came back to restore what had been lost from the from the time of Abraham. See, this covenant that fell in between, this was temporary because the people's hearts weren't ready. What God offered them in Exodus 15 was basically what Abraham had, walk by faith. But they weren't ready for that. So they had to have this uh, Levitical covenant with the Levitical priesthood. So they had, God had to set aside the Melchizedek priesthood, bring in the Levitical priesthood, do this whole section of, um, you know, years and years, 1500 years of the Levitical law to get their hearts ready for the new covenant that was coming when Jesus was resurrected. But I'll get to that in a second. Abraham walked in faith and uh, Jesus was restoring what had been lost. Like I said, like that Abraham walked in faith. So Jesus comes and he keeps the law perfectly and he fulfills it. And then on his death, the temple veil was torn and that signified, you know, a coming to a close of the law because they went into the Holy of Holies once a year on the day of atonement, they went into the Holy of Holies to ask for forgiveness for all the sins of Israel for the last year. And so now they have no way to go into that room because the, the temple can't, the, the veil can't be torn <laughs> of that uh, curtain when they go in there. Everything in the temple had to be perfect. Jesus tears that veil in, in half right down the middle. And I, if you don't know, that curtain that they had was one solid piece of material. You entered from the left and the right of the um, sides. You didn't enter through the middle. So he tears it down the middle. Now the only way to enter into atonement and forgiveness from God would be to rely on the sacrifice at the cross. Before Jesus was crucified, 
he had the Last Supper or the Passover dinner with his apostles and he takes the bread and the wine. Now this is taking us back to Melchizedek. We're trying to remember back who's the only other person in scripture that sat down with um, someone like that and blessed them and gave them the bread and wine. So that would be Melchizedek. So Jesus is doing them to take their minds back to Melchizedek. Now I'm sure the night that they were doing it, it didn't occur to them because it's part of the Passover festival to have wine and unleavened bread. But in, in order for Jesus to, for them to think of this later, he's got to make a big deal about having the wine and the bread. And so he says that the, the bread is going to represent his body and the wine is going to represent his blood, but his blood hadn't been shed yet. Okay. He has this, um, sacrament with them and then he goes, uh, you know, he's taken before Pilate and all that stuff and, and put on the cross. I, in my mind, I think this whole deal of Jesus being put on the cross so that's his blood that's shed for us that matches up with in the old testament where moses said will you agree to keep the covenant and they said yes before they even knew the covenant and he threw blood on them then he goes back to god and says okay they've agreed to do it and then he, god says today tomorrow and the third day i will come to them well this is the same thing jesus blood is shed for them on the cross and then the third day in the morning just like the first covenant from the time that he is crucified he is going to rise again and that's when i believe that the new covenant started to go into effect now something else interesting about that is that in the old testament when they got the sinai covenant they had about 40 years that they were in the wilderness that they were in covenant but not fully in covenant because there were certain laws that they could not fulfill until they got into the promised land uh, some of the things like the feast day festivals and things like that they weren't able to be done until God established a city with his name which would be Jerusalem so in the wilderness they weren't necessarily doing those the way that they were commanded to and God would give them commandments and say when you get in the promised land this is what you're supposed to do so for 40 years they're in a covenant but not fully in the covenant and it's the same way I believe when Jesus died that the veil was torn yes but the temple was still standing and so a lot of people were still keeping a lot of the Old Testament laws because they you know the covenant was still or the temple was still standing there we even read that paul went in there and did a vow just to keep the you know show people that he wasn't teaching against the law and, and i kind of you know people always say well see, paul was definitely teaching against the law i definitely think he was teaching gentiles not to keep the law but i think there was this murky area for the jews as long as the temple was standing they were kind of like in between like i said kind of like they were back in the wilderness they were in between covenants or in between getting the full covenant and being in a part of covenant but when the temple goes down in 70 a.d which i believe was 40 years later because i believe jesus died in 30 a.d and so therefore exactly 40 years later just like exactly 40 years later in the wilderness then when the temple is destroyed that changes everything now everything about the that was involved with the temple in the law is over and that even includes the food laws were about the temple, just everything in the law pretty much revolved around the temple and the arbitrators of the old covenant law were the Levitical priesthood and now there is no more Levitical priesthood. God scattered them all over the place and he replaced it with the priesthood of Melchizedek which takes us back to the time previous to the law which was the time of Abraham and we read over and over in the New Testament that we are saved by the faith same kind of faith that Abraham had so the same kind of faith that Abraham had also had the Melchizedek covenant so or the Melchizedek priesthood so when we read in Peter when he says that I we're now a nation of of uh, kingdom of priests well what priesthood is that it's not the Levitical priesthood it's the Melchizedek priesthood so which is a priesthood based on faith Jesus rises from the dead and we get the new covenant like I said and it mimics the Exodus 19 through 20 uh, their covenant coming on the third day in the morning the now the apostles actually after Jesus you know we have the day of Pentecost which that's interesting in itself because the day of Pentecost was the same exact day that the Jews would go to Israel for this festival called uh, Shavuot now at Shavuot which was about 50 days after um, first fruits uh, which was the Sunday after Passover Pentecost happens on a Sunday or at least on the what they consider the first day of the week so Pentecost happens on the first day of the week and what's interesting is the reason that all these people are there that speak all these different languages 
because if you read in Acts 2, everybody that's there hears the gospel in their language. The reason they're all there is because they're there for Shavuot. Shavuot and Pentecost are the same. Pentecost is the uh, Greek word for Shavuot. So all the people are there. And what's interesting is back in the, the Pentecost celebration or Shavuot is actually a celebration of the giving of the Ten Commandments. That's why they celebrated it. When Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, when he came back down and found out that they had built the golden calf and all that, he ordered them to slay the men that were worshiping the golden calf. Three, it, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament that 3,000 died on that day when they were slaying the people that built the golden calf. In the New Testament, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible tells us that 3,000 people were saved. So the exact same day in the New Testament as the Old Testament uh, Shavuot, the Shavuot in the New Testament, 3,000 people are saved. In the Old Testament, 3,000 people died. I just think that's an amazing little fact a lot of people don't know. Uh, over this time, after Jesus ascends to heaven and after the gospel's gone out from uh, Jerusalem, the word of the Lord has gone out from Jerusalem. That's a prophecy that was fulfilled from the Old Testament. It says the law will go out from Jerusalem. Law means instructions in the Old Testament. So now the instructions go out from Jerusalem at, at the day of Pentecost so that all of these people that came in from other nations can take this gospel back to their own cities, which is amazing. The gospel is going to spread from this feast day, uh, from Pentecost slash Shavuot. So they go back and teach people stuff. But so now we're under the new covenant now at this time. And the new covenant is a lot like Abraham's covenant. It looks almost identical to the old, the, uh, the way Abraham walked with God in faith. Sometimes people say, well, the new covenant has new laws and, and it does. God says that he's not going to, uh, that when he gives them the new covenant, it's not going to be like the one he gave to their forefathers. Well, it's not because it's going to be like the one he gave to, to it's going to be like the instructions that he gave to Abraham and to Noah and to Isaac and Jacob, all the people that lived before the Sinai covenant. It's going to be like that. So it's not necessarily brand new. It's a lot like what they had before the Levitical law went in place, which was temporary just to get people to turn their hearts towards getting ready for the Messiah. Uh, Jesus now though is sitting at the right hand of the father. And in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that he is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And again, I pointed out that Melchizedek is not appointed due to bloodline like the Levitical bloodline. Melchizedek is chosen due to his righteousness and holiness. God chooses who he wants to be in the order of Melchizedek. When Peter says that the followers of Jesus are kingdom of priests, he's saying that we're in the Melchizedek priesthood. So right now, and this would just be, again, this is conjecture on my part. I can't say for sure. And there's so many different theories about how the world comes to an end. So I'm just going to give you my, my idea. And you know, if it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, I'll definitely come back sometime in the future and say, Hey, I've changed my mind. But so how I think it all comes to a close is Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the father right now. And then at a time in the future, when he well, on the day of the Lord, which is the day of judgment, then he will come back to gather his people up to meet him in the air. And then he will come down to earth and he will, from what I understand, I don't know if that's, it sounds like that's when we get the new heaven and the new earth, because according to Peter on the day of the Lord is when the heavens and the earth are burnt up. And the day of the Lord appears to be the day that Jesus comes back. So Jesus comes back to comes back. We meet him in the clouds and clouds is another topic altogether. Clouds can refer to theophanic clouds, meaning angels like clouds of angels. So it could just be that we're meeting, meeting him in groups of angels. So, you know, whereas we think it's going to be in the sky, it could actually be on earth in groups of angels. I don't know. You know, that's something I don't, it makes no difference to me. Jesus is coming back. That's all I care about. Then he will destroy the heaven and the heaven, current heavens and the earth. It seems to me from what I read in scripture, and then there'll be a new heavens and earth. Then, you know, all this judgment has happened before this, you know, all the things that, um, that are supposed to happen to bring things to a close. And then Jesus will reign on earth on this, in this new kingdom. And this, this new kingdom is comprised of all of God's people, the people that you know, chose Jesus as their savior. That'll be, I guess, people that come back from heaven. I'm still a little murky on that too. Uh, all the Christians that come back with Jesus, or some people believe that the Christians who have died since Jesus died are in the ground awaiting their time or they're in paradise waiting till Jesus comes back. You know, I don't, 
I used to have concrete feelings on that, but now at this point, I've read so much different scripture that I just say, you know what, I don't, it doesn't matter. But the point is, Jesus is coming back, and I believe that he will reign on a new heaven and a new earth, and the people that will be on here, on the new heaven and the new earth, will be only the righteous, the ones that chose Jesus. They'll be the remnant of the Jews and the remnant of the Gentiles who actually put their faith in Jesus, and then we'll be back to a more of a Garden of Eden type state. The Bible tells us in the end, again, we'll be eating uh, the fruit of the trees for healing. So I do not believe there will be any animal eating in the future. I believe Jesus, when he died on the cross, that was once and for all. I know the book of Ezekiel talks about this third temple and the priesthood being reinstated and all that. I don't believe any of that is, is for the future. I believe that number one, Israel was told when, when Ezekiel wrote that to them, it said, if you will repent, then I will build this temple or whatever. Once Jesus came and we find out that he is the final offering, I just don't see how there's any way that we're going to be having sacrifices by the Zadok priesthood again in the temple, like it says in Ezekiel. Second of all, and a lot of people don't notice this because I didn't for many, many years, is that the book of Ezekiel is actually not written in the order he received the visions. If you put them in order, that Ezekiel's temple comes long before Israel is judged by the end of his visions. So when Ezekiel got his visions, if you put them in order, they're, so when that temple is supposed to be built, and again, like I said, it didn't get to be built because they never repented and turned back to the Lord. So God offered, you know, this temple with the Zadok priesthood residing in it and all of that. But then Ezekiel's book was written in 13 scrolls, you know, and if you look in there, you'll see the dates. He'll even give you the dates at the beginning of each vision of when he got it. And so if you put them in order, the temple happens, but then just a couple of scrolls later, it talks about Israel being judged, Judah particularly, Judah and Jerusalem being judged. So, And that's how it ends, with Judah and Jerusalem being judged, which the whole world is going to be judged. But if you know the scriptures, it talks about how everything always starts with the house of God. You know, if we want to make change, we start at the house of God. Well, in the end too, I believe, because Paul always talks about first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, I believe Judah and Jerusalem will be judged first and then the world will be judged. Anyway, that's kind of how I see it. Again, I don't like to speculate about the end times, but I know a lot of people, if I just left it off at uh, without going into any of that, there'd always be people who would wonder. These are my opinions. Again, I, I feel like based on scripture, this is what I think, not based on what man teaches, because what, what I've just gone through isn't necessarily the average uh, evangelical teaching. But anyway, that's how I see it. So that's an overview of the Bible. If you have any other questions, you can put them below, but I've always just kind of wanted to do a walkthrough of scripture. And again, this was just off the top of my head based on what I know. So I'm sure I forgot some things, but I wanted to establish why and I guess I didn't really get into that. Why the Jew? Well, the Jews say they're the chosen people. Actually, Israel was the chosen people. Um, but the reason they were chosen is because God had to bring his seed, Jesus, through a bloodline. And he picked Abraham's because Abraham was walking righteously. Well, that makes sense because Abraham was related to Noah. In fact, um, there was a time overlapping where Abraham was alive on earth at the same time as Noah's descendants and maybe even Noah were still alive. So he probably went to Uncle Noah's house and hung out and learned some stuff. So anyway, God chooses Abraham and then through his seed, he will bring Jesus. So that's why they were the chosen people. It's, it's not because they were righteous. He even says, I didn't pick you because you were the biggest nation. I didn't pick you because you were the best. It's just somebody had to be picked. And so and that brings me to another point. You know, people are always like, oh, we're in heaven. We're going to speak in Hebrew because that's the language that God spoke from the beginning. I don't necessarily believe that because we don't know what language he spoke from the beginning. All we know is that when he divided the 70 nations, Abraham was a Hebrew. His people spoke Hebrew and that's who God chose. Whether Hebrew was the language from the beginning and that's what he gave to Abraham's people. I don't know. I, I would say that's a guess also. So I know what we have now today isn't really even real Hebrew. It's from what I've heard, it's more like Chaldean or something. Anyway, that's my overview and I will be back soon to do a whole series on sacrifices. I have been working on it and Melchizedek. Man, that's a good topic. I love talking about Melchizedek. That's actually the meat that we're told instead of the milk in scriptures. And that's, it really is. When you understand the Melchizedek priesthood, it really is the meat. Without it, you'll just always be on milk and and that's a sad state to be in. Anyway, okay, well, I will talk to you guys soon. Thanks for bearing with me for 30 minutes. Bye-bye. <laughs>